lucky where there's so much fantastic stuff at this conference. So thank you for coming. Uh, so I'm really just talking about, well, I'll tell you in a second. I'm really just talking about open source industry Australia, our experience pretty much over the last year in interactions with, with government. So uh, I'm an open source developer. I live in Melbourne. Uh, I've got a little company called Coherent Software. I've been working around the Apache OFBiz project for quite a few years now, which is an open source enterprise resource planning system. So I've been working around that. And for two and a half years, 2014 to 2016, I was a director of Open Source Industry Australia. Just stepped down from that, but I want to talk a little bit about our experience over the, uh, particularly over the last year. So uh, we've got Nick Moore over here, who's currently on the board, and Amy Marie Forstrom is probably going to be at the conference later on in the week. She's also a director of ASIA, and uh, Daniel Jitner was here yesterday, and he's, he's served as well, still there on the board. Okay, first thing I want to say is I don't want to claim credit for stuff that I didn't do. I was one player in a team, and as I'm going through things we did during the last year, I will try and say a little bit about who led different efforts that we did to try and make that clear. I am no longer an official uh, person, official director of ASIA, so while a lot of what I'm going to say is ASIA's position that we gave to various governments' forums, still, if there's an opinion out of that context, please take that as mine, not as an official statement of ASIA, and uh, as an organisation, ASIA can say I was wrong any time that they want to. And I certainly don't speak for the government agencies that we interacted with, so during the talk I will sometimes try and represent my take on what they had to say, and it is just my take. And again, I could be wrong, my interpretation, I've had to, of course, summarise a lot of these things that people have had to say, and maybe I've got the summary a little bit wrong. So with those disclaimers, Let's go. So I do want to say a little bit about ASIA. I don't want it to be an ad, and it's certainly something you could talk about with Nick and myself at other times during the conference if you want to. So a little bit about that, but very simple from there on. First thing I want to talk about is just what we did, and in there we'll be talking about issues that have been coming up in this mini-conf, in uh, Pia's talk this morning, and in general, I think, through the conference, so a lot of those issues you'll be familiar with and we'll be saying something about those. And something about, well, my thoughts on what, as a, the open source community, we can learn from this stuff and uh, maybe do things slightly differently in the future. Okay, so Open Source Industry Australia has been around quite a while. Um, Donna, you were on the board a while ago? Once upon a time, yeah, Arjen Lentz, many of you know, he was a uh, director of ASIA for a while, so so has been around quite a while. And it is the industry association for basically companies that work in the open source area. So goals, here we go. So both government and business encourage them to use open source and open standards, try and uh, have our input and to help governments building policies to support the growth and success of the open source industry and to try and make Australia a good place for this stuff to happen. That's what we've been trying to do, that's what we are trying to do. Okay, so during 2016, here's a list of things that we got involved with and then for much of the talk, I'll just be doing a bit of a tour through these things. So first thing early in the year was there was a paper put out by the Australian Tax Office, Digital by Default. Uh, the Department of Finance had a discussion paper about thinking about common whole of government services and we had some input into that. Uh, the Productivity Commission, I'll say a bit more about those. They've had two inquiries during 2016 and the last thing I'll be talking about is there are in fact not one but two committees of the Australian Parliament that have been looking into the Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership, the TPP. So I'm just going to be touring through those, say a little bit about our inputs, what we had to say or what ASIA had to say in there, and sometimes a bit about what these various government agencies had to say as well. So first up, digital by default. So this was fairly early in 2016. 
And we came up with a response to a discussion paper from the Australian Tax Office. They're talking about encouraging digital services, encouraging people to use those in preference to other ways of exchanging and submitting information to the Australian Tax Office. Uh, a goal having simpler, more streamlined services. So I had a fair bit to do with putting together our submission there. By the way, every single one of these that we're going to be looking at are available on the ASIA website. So you can have a look at all of these for yourselves. You can download them from the ASIA website, which is simply asiya.com.au. Okay, so one of the things we highlighted to the tax office was trying to get the left hand and the right hand of the government to talk to each other. So the Digital Transformation Office, which during the year uh, evolved into the Digital Transformation Agency, uh, they, so everything we said here, it comes from their basic principles. So they've been advocating open standards common government solutions, uh, opening up source code, making it open and reusable, and being platform agnostic, uh, being able to get to ATO services from uh, platforms, browsers, and devices. And I think the Australians in the room will know that the ATO's had a pretty poor history here where they have had online things. There's been a limits in which platforms you could use to, to get to these things. So, uh, as I said, our submission to them uh, in response to their discussion papers on our website. So we advocated for unencumbered open standards, data formats, and APIs. One of the things in the middle of digital by default is there's an XML-based thing, XBRL, uh, for exchanging business information. And sadly, there are patent claims around that. Now, the Australian Tax Office can't prevent somebody from applying for a patent. And around standards, there's this general issue about are they patent, in, uh, patent encumbered? And there's this phrase I've got here, reasonable and non-discriminatory. So in some circumstances, some standards, there's this thinking that, well, if you have to pay a royalty to use a patent, provided that royalty is reasonable and non-discriminatory, maybe that's OK. And as a general proposition, as I was saying, no, there really shouldn't be. So any of these things should be freely, uh, able to be freely implemented. And of course, from the point of view of creating open source software, if there's any sort of, of royalty at all that's necessary to build some software that implements a standard, that's a real barrier to entry for the open source community. So while the tax office can't, or other government agencies as well, while they can't prevent somebody trying to apply for a patent that builds on a standard or is necessary to implement a standard, they can participate and do participate in standards formation. And we've tried to encourage them to vigorously oppose that, to be aware of that, to watch that. And when they are trying to build standards, to uh, try and make sure that this doesn't happen. The other thing we suggested is that they can uh, curate test data and test suites to make it easier for software developers to build software that meets this sort of stuff. Uh, we talked about the tax office using open source more for their own systems, uh, for things like example implementations. And we advocated for using the digital by default process to simplify and replace their own processes rather than adding something new or adding some new layer of complexity. And the other thing we said is, well, we had a fierce argument quite a while ago about the Australia card in Australia, which ended up getting uh, abandoned. And we really suggested that digital by default shouldn't be a way of introducing that stuff by stealth. In the digital by default discussion paper, there was some I think they're contemplating trying to not just encourage people to use online digital processes, but compelling them to in situations where the tax office thinks that that's uh, feasible. So we said, really, the ATO shouldn't be judging anyone's business strategy, shouldn't be judging for any organization, cost effectiveness, people should be doing that for themselves, or people's ability 
to negotiate these things. All of those should be our decisions. And if digital by default or digital processes really work well, they'll sell themselves. And there's really no need to compel anyone to start to use this stuff. If they really do work well, it will happen quite naturally anyway. OK, second one I want to talk about is a discussion paper from the Australian Department of Finance about shared and common IT services for the Australian Public Service. So Amy Marie led this one. And here's a quote from their discussion paper. So over 200 unique ERP systems and somewhere else, I think there's over 80 separate implementations of one ERP system, SAP, uh, around the Australian public service. They're all different, they're all customised, as they say. No common data definitions, processes or contractual arrangements. So there's an immense amount of duplication. And uh, as the discussion paper says, agencies are making investment decisions in isolation. There's reduced purchasing power, unnecessary conflicting customization, and uh, a seller's market rather than the government with immense buying power being able to get some value for the money they spend on IT. So things we talked about. When the government's making decisions on suppliers, they should be looking at capability, not necessarily size. And when we have shared common code, there's more scope for consortiums, for uh, people to participate, rather than just having one supplier. We make the point that open source enables a genuine competitive marketplace for support. So when the code for a system is freely accessible to anybody, more than one person can support that. And open source licenses encourage sharing and commonality, which is going to counteract this fragmentation that the Department of Finance was seeing in their stuff. Smaller agencies are often in a position where they can't make so much of these decisions for themselves. So he said, well, don't mandate. Again, if things are good enough and compelling enough, they'll sell themselves. And smaller agencies should be more involved in analysis and design. Open source allows you to change your mind about responsibilities. So one possibility is that agencies can do some of the support for systems in-house, can hire and train people to work on support for systems and can have second, third tier support outsourced and can change their minds about that boundary if they want to over time. Open software and formats makes it easier to migrate data, and I'm not the first person to make this point, you've probably heard it before, but it is something to think about that migration between different systems is expensive, but one way to consider that is really it's a hidden cost of closed source software. You're buying into it from the beginning when you adopt closed source software. And we also encouraged the Department of Finance and the Australian public sector in general to resist maintenance fees where they're not actually getting demonstrable benefit for their investment. During uh, the, our response to their discussion paper, we uh, said you really need to be looking at well-established licenses so everybody understands what their obligations are. Government needs to build some understanding of open source licenses. And one more thing here. Uh, there have been cases in the Australian public sector where people looking at adopting open source software have wanted some sort of guarantee that there's not going to be some copyright issue in the future. And that's absolutely responsible. That is fine. The provenance of where software came from is an important issue, and you run risks if you don't pay some attention to that. Our point is that there's actually a higher risk with closed source software. It's a black box. You really do not know where it came from. There's nothing in the open. There's very little opportunity to audit that. And it could easily be your closed source software that someone has borrowed some code from somewhere and there's the same sort of copyright issue, it's just more difficult to detect and it might bite you very hard later on. So if you're adopting software, these sorts of guarantees are fine. It should be the case no matter where the software came from, not just for open source. Okay, there's this 
outfit called the Productivity Commission, where you can more or less guess, I think, what they do from the name. So their job is to look at important issues in Australia to do with government, law, economics, and so on. And our interaction with them has been pretty good. I think the Productivity Commission is a very valuable organisation as a whole, and we were quite impressed with the way they operate. So it's two productivity inquiries that happened during 2016. So the first of them is in Australia's laws around intellectual property. And you can see during the year there's been two submissions being made, an initial one, and after their draft report came out a second one. Uh, we went to a public hearing in June, so several things to do with intellectual property arrangements. So the Productivity Commission, there's, there's economists in there which aren't so prominent among Australia's bureaucracy and politicians. And so to some extent, I think uh, that's an oversimplification, of course, but economists blowing the whistle when uh, bureaucrats and politicians aren't doing sensible things. Uh, at least in principle, they're talking about having a rational process for decision making. And uh, I personally wish there was more of that. Okay, so his principles that they talked about for intellectual property laws. So we're talking about copyright, patents, a few other things as well. So they identified these four principles to which we added one more. So effective, efficient, adaptable, accountable. And uh, we were talking about thinking more about the end user, which can get lost very easily in the middle of all this. So the Productivity Commission made the point that where we are going to have copyright or patent law, and the principle behind that is we're going to encourage creators to create stuff. So, and we, we want to ensure that creative people do create stuff. We want to foster that, but their point is there, there should be incentives only where they're actually going to produce a result, and only where needed, only as much as needed. And encourage and don't impede follow on innovation, competition, and access. So Australia, and I think this is the case in many other places in the world as well, patents have been too easy to obtain. They've been low quality, and there's been limited opportunity for follow-on innovation. In particular, I make brief mention here of a thing called innovation patents. They used to be called petty patents in Australia, and I think that gives you the idea. So there's a lower hurdle for how inventive a patent has to be. And the Productivity Commission and indeed ASIA have been saying for years, really, we should get rid of them altogether. And several times the Productivity Commission have said that. It'd be nice if it actually happens. So the Productivity Commission said in their discussion papers, and you can see it's still in their final report, that copyright lasts longer than it really needs to. And it seems at the moment there's a push to extend copyright. Uh, we should be thinking a lot about end users, and that can get lost. So there are people in the game, intellectual property, lawyers, big content creators that are very vocal, and we need to think about the benefit to the end user. And one of the points they made, and you can find evidence for this very quickly. So in the last couple of years in Australia, we've had an explosion of, of Netflix being available, for instance. Timely and cost-effective access to content has been reducing, genuinely has been reducing copyright infringement. When it's easier and simpler and when people can see value, they will pay for content. Uh, it's demonstrable. So our input into this stuff well, vested interests are very well, resented, very well represented, end users less so. Software patents, of course, in particular, are barriers to, process, to progress. Pretty much any software relies on other software that's very difficult to find unique inventiveness. And a little meme for those of you that participate in this area, I think it was Jack Burton who came up with this idea. I haven't run into it before. And it's a, a take on this which I think is worth considering and uh, talking about. That is, why have double regulation? So software, I think, is close to unique, probably unique, in that both copyright and patents apply. Surely only one or the other is enough. There needs to be some sort of regulation, intellectual property regulation, 
surely only one or the other. So double regulation is a real impediment, makes, makes things complicated. And uh, so if it's copyrightable, why should it be patentable as well? Free access to commons has tremendous value, and I don't think I need to, uh, I think everybody in this room is familiar with that idea. So if the purpose of copyright is to give incentives to creators to create, then economic return on investment is much shorter than copyright terms in Australia. So if you're embarking on some commercial project, you'd be looking for return on investment in a limited number of years, you know, two, five years. And we've got copyright that's, that's tens of years, 50, 70 years. Uh, authors certainly don't need it after they're dead. Now, there's no further incentive. So uh, extending it beyond uh, an author's lifetime, there's no point to that. Governments don't need it at all. They're still going to create content. We don't need incentives for governments to create new content. In fact, it would be great if they could um, make content a bit more concentrated and punch in a little less of it. That would be a good thing. So governments don't need it at all. So crown copyright's a very curious idea. So we said reduce copyright terms, don't extend them. And the other thing that we talked about was explicit provision for Creative Commons and open source in Australia's Copyright Act. That would be a very useful thing. One of the things in the middle of this stuff is trying to treat embedded software as a special case for patents. So in New Zealand, software is no longer covered by, uh, patents don't apply to software anymore. There's talk of it in other places in the world. And people get concerned about, well, what if that software is embedded in some gadget that otherwise might have a patent? So our take on that is it's still software. One more from the Productivity Commission. So this is talking about the publishing and management of data. So there's been an inquiry on this. So uh, big, interesting public sector data sets. And at the moment in Australia, uh, regulation and standards around this are very fragmented. The major piece of regulation around it is privacy. So for data where there really aren't privacy issues, there isn't really good regulation or management of that. So the right to access your own data is piecemeal. There's different legislation in different jurisdictions, no broad principles. So the Productivity Commission was saying in their, uh, in their discussion papers and their reports that people should have control over data that's relevant to them. We should identify data sets that are of broad national interest uh, any data that's non-personal, non-confidential, that uh, can be important from the point of view of people doing analysis, study, so on, should be released by default. So flipping the defaults, so if there aren't privacy issues, then it should be released by default. And don't just consider access to data through a privacy lens. Privacy is, of course, important. There are other things we should think about as well. So they're proposing something quite ambitious. That's a, a new act for data sharing, a new national data custodian that will uh, build standards around this stuff. And where there are other agencies that publish important data, they'll be accredited and there'll be standards they need to work around to do that. Uh, there'll be a built-in right for you to view and correct information that's relevant to you and to machine-readable copy. So stuff that can be processed, other things can be built from that. And any other legislation that places restrictions on this sort of publishing of data, uh, the Productivity Commission says that, uh, or proposes, that that should be replaced by a new act. So they were asking during this process these sorts of questions. So what makes a good data set? So this is what we had to say here. So accurate, complete, significant, timely. What impediments? So I've never been a public servant, so there are limits to what I can say about this stuff, but uh, my perception on it uh, is that there's a lot of avoidance of risk. People get punished for doing the wrong thing, don't get rewarded for doing good things, and the result is they keep their heads down. False sense of ownership. Uh, agencies have data which has already been gathered at taxpayer expense, and if we've paid for it, we should have access to it, and that's not, all, not always the case. Agencies trying to make commercial return 
out of data that they've gathered at taxpayer expense and fragmentation, one-off thinking and projects. Another question they asked was how to use data better. So we made the point here that if you have structured data, it's not too hard to create something human readable out of that. Going in the other direction is difficult. There should be much less need for scrapers. We know they're very widely used at the moment. Uh, anything that the data is naturally already accessible where we don't need to do scraping, that would be great. And allowing the public to talk back. So again, many of us here would be familiar with this. So for instance, PHP, one of the great things about PHP's documentation is all the chatter that goes on down the bottom. So when documentation is poor, misleading, incomplete, you have the chance to say something about that. So we proposed allowing the public to talk back and say more about that. We suggested standardising collection and sharing and using metadata. Now, TPP, okay, I'll need to go through this fairly quickly, but there were two parliamentary committees that have looked into this. The first one is Joint House of Representatives and Senate, and then there's a second one that came along later on in the year. So both of these were looking at the TPP. Uh, there were submissions we made to both of them. There was a public hearing that we went to. So as you can see, aside director Jack Burton led a lot of that. So TPP, you're probably familiar with, a free trade agreement between uh, Pacific Rim countries to reduce trade barriers and tariff and so on. A lot of the TPP really isn't about trade at all. So our take on it was we recommended to the government or our, our statement was it shouldn't be ratified. Uh, a new agreement, we're not against free trade, and we certainly don't want negotiations to occur in secret. For intellectual property in particular, there's a chapter in the TPP on that, there are already worldwide agreements on that stuff. So we really don't need regional ones for intellectual property. Uh, investor state dispute resolution gives rights to overseas companies that Australian ones don't have. We've talked about copyright before, and that was certainly in there, and TPP contemplated extending copyright. So what difference did we make? I think we've seen a growing awareness of open source in the public sector with maybe some hesitancy to actually adopt it. Uh, the Productivity Commission quoted several times things that we had to say. Uh, we certainly don't claim all, all or even most of the credit, but maybe we had something to do with the TPP has stalled. Uh, Maybe we had something to do with that. Politicians, I think we had less influence over. I think often they've pre-decided policy permissions and we've had limited influence over them. So, lessons learned. I think looking back on it, that we could, and I would encourage anyone in the future, we've got other open source uh, associations and so on, and several of them that are working in this sort of area, I think we could do more in the, in the open. We're used to building code bases and contributing revisions and so on. I think we could do more of that in the open. There's a real danger for some of these things of regulatory capture that the insiders get a say and the general public does not. And in general, we'd like to see and encourage reasoned decision making. So if you're interested in this stuff, you can help. Uh, certainly, if you're involved at all in a company, a business in open source, well, have a look at open source industry Australia, but other, other places as well. So of course, Linux Australia, free software, EFA, all of those. And there's a size website there, asai.com.au. Uh, thanks to Donna and Deb for today and to the Asai directors who participated in this stuff. So thank you. <laughs>